What is up, everyone? Welcome back to another fantastic high yield episode today. Let's not move so much. What is up, everyone? Welcome back to another high yield episode today. We're covering the step two pulmonology, the highest, highest yield uh, topic matter. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to step two pulmonology. I'm Bo. This is some high yield stuff. If you look at the breakdown for step two, Pulm is up there as one of the most important things to know. It encompasses a whole lot of things like epidemiology, infectious disease, cancer, cardiopulmonary stuff. So it's something you got to know. So let's move forward accordingly. Why is this down here? Fuck. Okay. What's up, everyone? Welcome back. This is Bo... What's up everyone, welcome back. We have a fantastic high yield short presentation for y'all regarding step two pulmonology. Pause the video when it... What's up everyone, this is Bo here. We have a Q&A step two pulmonology back and forth. So we're gonna go over this high yield PowerPoint real quick. When you see the question, pause it, look at the chest x-ray, look at the EKG, look at whatever images up there and see if you can figure out the answer before I go over it and we'll move forward like that, all right? Ready, let's go. So first question, 65 year old guy, orthopnea, dyspnea, and exertion, you see this on chest x-ray, what's the treatment? Well, two parts, right? So what's the diagnosis? Dyspnea, orthopnea, chest x-ray findings showing bilateral kind of infiltrates, more prominent in the lower lobes, maybe you can't really see uh, the diaphragmatic angles as well as you'd like, maybe the heart border's a little fuzzy, so you think, hey, this is probably heart failure and the treatment for that in this case would be Right, aggressive diuresis, fantastic. All right, so that is the answer there. All right, next slide, 78 year old former pirate because sea shanties are in right now and shipbuilder comes in. This is what you see in the lungs, which is pretty gnarly. This is an image that Bobby found. What would you say uh, is going on? What's the most likely malignancy this patient will have? Well, right, anytime you see shipbuilder, pirate, among other things, uh, you think about asbestos and then so that's the first step in this question the second step is what's the most likely cancer and the answer is actually a bronchogenic or non small cell lung cancer like a squamous cell cancer it's actually not mesothelioma although when you do see that uh, you can very much attribute it to asbestos exposure but it's still not the most common so always that's always a gotcha that's always kind of an epidemiologic gotcha so calcified pleural on the chest x-ray as you can see Otherwise, look for non-small cell lung cancer, uh, although mesothelioma is quite specific for asbestos. Fantastic. Those were two easy gimmies. We're getting a little harder now. We have a 42-year-old female short of breath after a long ride. What's the most common abnormal EKG finding? So ignore the EKG finding on the screen right now. What's just the most abnormal EKG finding in a patient with the pathology described below? Right. So if you said sinus tachycardia, you'd be correct because this patient likely has a pulmonary embolism. Perfect. But what EKG finding is up here? That's right, this is the very specific, less sensitive, but very specific finding of S1, Q3, T3. So you can see the S wave in lead one, and then the Q wave in T, excuse me, Q wave in lead three, and then the inverted T as well in lead three. So, sinus tachycardia is the most common pathologic EKG finding in pulmonary embolism, but the EKG here shows S1, Q3, T3. As an aside, what would you see on chest X-ray? Most likely, Probably nothing, that's right. PEs are very hard to find with a chest x-ray. All right, so next question. 56 year old female, non-smoker, new peripheral mass, what's the diagnosis? So this is just a classic, you either know it or you don't. When you have a non-smoker, when you have a female, you always think about adenocarcinoma, especially if it's peripheral. Uh, so in this case, it would be a peripheral adenocarcinoma of the lung, and that would be the answer. I'm going quickly, guys, but you can find this PDF um, and even more PDFs like this on our website, buzzwordsmed.com, so don't worry. Next question, 43-year-old IV drug user. What is the diagnosis and where is the murmur? So, you see this, you see multiple emboli on the CT, you see maybe one lesion on the chest x-ray. What are you thinking about this IV drug user? Right, pulmonary emboli, more specifically septic pulmonary emboli, likely in the setting of endocarditis. And we've learned about endocarditis before, but in most normal individuals, endocarditis would be found on which valves? Right, mitral being number one and aortic being number two. And by normal, I mean non-drug users, uh, but regardless, when I have a drug user, where would I expect the endocarditis? Right, at least for the purposes of the step two or step one exam, 
it's going to be the tricuspid valve. And therefore, you're most likely going to hear it in the tricuspid location. And so here's an extra tidbit. This is how deep the step exam will get. They'll give you all of this and they'll say, where's the murmur? What's the murmur like? So you have to know what the description of the murmur is. And then you need to know uh, kind of what would make the murmur louder or quieter. So if I asked you, what kind of murmur would this be? And would it get louder on inspiration or quieter on inspiration? You have to know that, hey, this is tricuspid valve. Uh, so this is probably going to be regurg. It's probably going to be holosystolic. And because you're inspiring, when you inspire, blood comes back to the right side of the heart, making it more, uh, comes back to the right side of the heart, filling it up with blood, uh, you're likely going to have an increased uh, murmur intensity with inspiration. So that's the learning point there. So here you go. Fantastic. Next question. Next best step for this patient with a single lesion on chest x-ray. So this is uh, just, you just got to know this is the next best step. So you just got to know this is the next best step for any patient that comes with a solitary lesion on chest x-ray, and it is to compare to prior chest x-rays. Fantastic. All right, patient with new shortness of breath after starting treatment for atrial fibrillation. So this is seemingly very vague, and it's supposed to be like that. So you look on this chest x-ray, you can kind of see some diffuse infiltrates, more prominent on the periphery. They just started a medication for atrial fibrillation. You don't really know what it is, um, but because they're telling you that, it's probably likely an inciting event and therefore in this case you need to think about pneumonitis and the drug that you would think about for pneumonitis is right amiodarone so and you're thinking hey amiodarone i didn't learn that's for afib but yes it is for afib that's kind of recalcitrant to like rate control um you can you know of course try beta blockers and calcium channel blockers but uh amiodarone is used for afib as well and this is one of the side effects that can occur remember it can affect the thyroid it can affect the liver and it can affect the lungs. Fantastic. Next slide. What criteria do you use to differentiate pathology seen on this chest x-ray? So first you know what's the pathology on this chest x-ray. So right. If you can't see the costophrenic angle on the left hand side, you're thinking of a pleural effusion, right? Dude, these planes are fucking annoying. So many of them. I got a picture, I'm coming with you, dear Maria, let me in. Right, on the left hand side, you can't really see the costophrenic angle, so you're concerned about a pleural effusion. So how do you differentiate this pathology? Fantastic, the lights criteria, so exudative or transudative. So that is the answer, and here are the criteria. Remember, you always got to know what causes a transudative effusion and what causes an exudative effusion. Uh, a lot of the times with exudative effusions, you may need to actually go in there and put a chest tube and get it out. Maybe even push some TPA in to kind of get the fibers. Let's say, for example, it was an empyema, uh, kind of break that up. With a transudative, it's a little bit different. Oftentimes, you kind of treat the underlying disease, whether it be fluid overload from cirrhosis, nephrotic syndrome, or CHF, so diuresis, for example. But that will take much longer, but maybe the right choice on the exam. So. That's lights criteria for you. So 75 year old gentleman comes in, 50 pack year smoking history. He goes, doc, I smoked for 50 years, I smoked a pack a day. Uh, why are you telling me to stop? Does it really matter? And your answer would be, yes, it does matter because one of the couple things that show to have mortality benefits, smoking cessation is one of them. I think ox actually administration of oxygen when someone's SpO2 goes below 88 is another one. But uh, definitely smoking cessation uh, has shown to have a mortality benefit in those with CPOPD. So that's a fantastic thing to know, especially for your family medicine show, as well as for the step two exam. All right, guys, that is it for the PowerPoint. If you want this PowerPoint, if you want the other PowerPoints that we've made, if you want to go look at the practice test that we've made, or to find our podcast, go to buzzwordsmed.com. Everything is there for you. Until next time, have a fantastic day and a great rest of your week. Bye-bye now.